could be like Morgan King and I could be wearing one on each wrist, but I'm not I'm going Isn't it good? Yeah. What time what time do you need? What time do you want? I got multiples of times. And the date. Time and date. <laughs> hey guys, it's Cam from Craft and Tailored. And in this episode of What is on My Wrist, we're gonna be talking about some Universal Genev pull routers. So I've got two Universal Genev pull routers on my wrist. One is from 1965 and the other is from 1956. Really interesting. The reason why I have two watches strapped to my wrist uh, is to, one, I wanted to kind of provide a little bit of a historical overview about the pole router. Pole routers are watches that I think are quickly being realized as collectible by the market as a whole. They're also really cool watches, and I think there's a lot of value in watches like this, so uh, definitely worthy of some wrist time, and I've got two killer examples, so wanted to kind of um, take this opportunity to maybe kill two birds with one stone. The Pola router um, was basically a, a pilot's watch, and the story about the pole router and or the Pola router um, begins in 1954, um, and it would kind of be appropriate to start with some of the avi aviation pioneering history, if that makes sense, aviation pioneering history, uh, behind the pole router, um, to provide a little bit of a historical background. So in uh, 1952, uh, the Scandinavian Airline System, or SAS, uh, they began to fly the DC-6B commercial aircraft across uh, transatlantic routes. Um, and in just two years, they'd soon introduce the first flight to travel over uh, the geographical North Pole um, from their Copenhagen to Los Angeles route. So, um, by taking the road less traveled, so to speak, the SAS was able to cut down total flight times by as much as 14 hours, um, and that was allow them, allowing them to position themselves uh, as a force to be reckoned with amongst the ranks of uh, the other commercial airlines. Um, but what's interesting is the SAS wished to kind of commemorate their breakthrough of transcontinental travel with a timepiece. And um, the other thing that's kind of interesting is when you're flying across the poles, there are extreme magnetic fields. The name pole router actually comes from the SAS and their uh, route, which actually flew over the North Pole. Uh, additionally, pole routers had uh, an anti-magnetic capability, which is something that I think uh, both Universal Genev and uh, the Scandinavian airline system uh, was kind of looking to highlight and celebrate within the, the watch itself. Um, so really, really interesting. What's interesting about the pole routers uh, and the pole router lineup is that uh, the watch was actually the first, uh, or one of, I should say, the first commercial watches to be designed by a man that is arguably probably one of, arguably, arguably probably, that's, why is that such a tongue twister for me? It's Gerald Genta, people, all right? Gerald Genta designed the pole router, okay? So this is the Genta design. It's really, really interesting. Genta, if you don't know, if you were born under a rock inside of a barn in the middle of nowhere, uh, he designed uh, the uh, Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, and he also designed the uh, Patek Philippe Nautilus, among a ton of other watches. Uh, the dude knew what he was doing from a design perspective because he created some of the most iconic watches of all time. It actually all started though here with the pole router for Universal Geneb. A then 24 year old Gerald Genta designed the pole router and this was his first real commercial success in the field of, of watch design. Um, and so uh, really, really interesting horological history. It's designed by Genta and it's incredible. Apart from the anti-magnetic properties, the original Pola routers, and then obviously later Pole router, uh, were, were looked at for not only their good looks, but also their high capability. This is a really high quality timepiece. Um, what's interesting too is um, the first Pola routers leveraged uh, a caliber 138 bumper movement. So basically instead of having an oscillating weight or a micro rotor or some kind of rotor device, there's a, a, a bumper and we can talk about bumper movements later, but the first uh, pole routers leveraged uh, a 138 um, 
bumper movement and then later leveraged uh, the caliber 215 micro rotor movement. Uh, what's really interesting is the micro rotor movement is like really interesting from a design perspective because most watches that have an oscillating weight on the bottom of the movement, they tend to be a little bit thicker. But due to the fact that, that uh, the automatic or self-winding uh, pole routers have uh, the, the use of, of a micro rotor, it allows the watch to stay really, really thin, which is kind of an interesting design characteristic. I think Genta in general really liked thin watches. Obviously, you know, if you look at uh, Royal Oak or um, a Nautilus, those watches are very, very thin. Um, and kind of same thing here. It's a it's a dress watch, but ultimately it, it's very thin and it's also automatic, which is, which is really, really cool and interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the two examples that I have here. We'll start with the earlier one first. So this is a 1956, uh, Pole router reference 20357-2. Um, and what's really interesting about this specific example is it's very, very early. The condition is amazing. Um, I'll, I'll try to get a close-up of this, but you can actually see uh, you know, the, the case back strike very clearly in the back of the of the case, um, which is interesting because it's very thin and a lot of times that'll wear out or be polished off. So this one has it. Um, and the other thing that's really, really cool too um is that this is a very early example so um very clean dial we kind of have what, what we would call i guess a pie pan style dial where you have this brush center portion of the dial and then you have kind of this outer rehot which allows you to uh basically you know tell hours and you can divide it by quarters here and also you can kind of just see at a glance where the minutes are at um so this is an earlier example from 56 the lug width on these guys is 18, but the overall case size is, uh, it's 35, but it, it, but you, we're really splitting hairs. I think it wears more like a 36. So on wrist, it's really, really nice. Um, and it's kind of a nice, I think, functional time only watch. I really like the time only Universal Genevs um, for just kind of their simplistic design. Uh, really nice watch from the perspective of it. it does kick out a little bit of light with that, you know, kind of outer rehot being polished, but, um, very functional. The other thing that I really like about this, and it's kind of similar to, let's say, like a like an Omega Speedmaster Professional, is, is it's got these twisted lugs. So it kind of creates a little bit of a depth and dimension to the watch outside of a, a, a standard kind of like Rolex Oyster style case. There's a little bit of depth and feel to the to the case of, of the pole routers, which is really interesting. So this one is available for sale. I'll provide a, a link or a bubble so that you guys can check this one out specifically if you want to obtain more details. Um, but really, really nice piece. The second watch I want to discuss um, is actually a little bit later than the first one, um, and it's different because it does include a date complication. So um, same case size, it's 35, arguably 36. Um, but what's interesting is the pole router did come in date and non-date versions. Um, and something that's kind of interesting, this one again is from 1965. The reference is 204607 slash one. Um, and this is what we would call a black gilt dial. Sometimes these watches are referred to as uh, being like a tuxedo dial because you have this black center portion of the dial and then you have this silver kind of white, you know, like black and white um, style of, of watch. You can call it a tuxedo watch, um, but on the wrist it's, it wears formal, but again, kind of similar to the other one where, you know, this is on like a rough out uh, brown strap, which accents the dial really nicely, but kind of nice on wrist, you know, it's, it's formal, but not really. Um, the 204607-1 does include a date complication and it does still leverage a micro rotor movement, which is really, really interesting. Um, what's kind of unique about this is I love kind of the art deco feel of this watch, same twisted style lugs. Um, but what's interesting is if you look at the date window itself, it's kind of like chiseled out. It's not like a, like a, just a, like a block or a square. It's kind of more, I, I guess, like triangular. And what's also interesting on the original crystals is the Cyclops or the magnifying element is actually underneath the crystal. And it also follows the shape of the of the date window itself, which is like this, uh, I guess you could call it like a trapezoidal, trapezoidal, is that a word? Uh, but triangular, trapezoidal type of shape, which I think is really unique and kind of interesting to the watch. So just really interesting. One thing I did want to point out too is um, this is what we would call a, I don't know if you could technically call it date hacking, but a little like secret and tip is that when you're setting the date on these watches, instead of like going around in 24 hour increments, which would take freaking forever to set the date on this watch, 
you know? Takes a long time. There's a little tip and trick that I'm gonna show you. So after the date flips over at 12 o'clock, if you actually go backwards 15 minutes and then you go back, it'll actually flip the date. So there is a hacking movement. So if you go back and forth between nine o'clock and 12 o'clock, it'll quickly set the date. So it is a jumping or a quick set date technically, even though it's not, there's not a hacking or, or a, 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 a jumping quick set in the piece. So that's kind of a unique feature um, and something that I think, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like point out. We've actually had a couple of questions, people that have reached out asking if this is a, a quick set version, which, um, it actually is. So in any case, um, we did also just write a, a blog article about the the history of the pole router because I think that they're increasing in popularity. We're getting a lot of requests for these and trying to find good examples for, for you guys. Um, so I will provide a link in the description below, but you should definitely check out that article. There's a lot of really cool history about Genta and the design and kind of history behind uh, the, the pole routers, which I think is definitely worth a, a quick look and read if you're into pole routers. And then I'll also provide links in the description below and in the bubbles above so that you guys can check out these two specific examples. Um, so thanks for tuning in guys. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also be sure to subscribe or, or follow us on Instagram um, because that's where we post the latest finds and updates uh, from the team here at Craft & Taylor. Okay, so thanks for tuning in guys. I will see you in the next one.